Two weeks ago, I preached a message on Bible prophecy, Russia's war with Ukraine. I am doing part two of that message today. The events of end time Bible prophecy appear to be like a surreal road movie to many Christians. Because of the fascination, because of the mystery and the drama of what is prophesied to take place, end time prophetic events, especially those recorded in the book of Revelation, are seen as separate and distinct from the rest of the Bible and that they are completely divorced from holy Christian living as an everyday lifestyle. So, since my last message, I have decided to do part two uh, to try to bring a proper balance in how we understand what God really requires of us in our everyday Christian walk in the light of unfolding um, prophetic fulfillment that we see before our eyes today. Now, I also want to include here that although this is part two of that uh, original message, Bible prophecy, Russia's war with Ukraine, I want to subtitle today's teaching as Russia's coming wars, and that's plural, wars, Russia's coming wars, the beginning of birth pains. Now, when he was speaking about the signs of his coming, um, wars and rumors of wars, nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, and so on, Jesus said that all those things, they were the beginning of sorrows or the beginning of birth pains. So, my scripture references today are taken from uh, Matthew's Gospel, Luke, Ezekiel, as well as the book of Revelation. Now, Luke 21 deals with end time events, just like um, chapter 24 of Matthew's Gospel. And uh, I want you to keep in mind that just as the Bible was accurate at predicting Jesus' first coming in what I call high definition detail, you can believe that the Bible is also accurate in predicting his second coming. It will be at a time, the Bible says, a day and time when we do not expect him a day and hour when nobody knows. But even though we do not know the day nor the hour, we should at least know the signs of the times pointing to his return as they are recorded in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. Now, some of the signs we know will be natural disasters and some will be man-made disasters but jesus says when you see these things increasing when you see those signs increasing know that those things are the beginning of birth pains so the earth is going to go into a time of travail just as a woman uh, in labor the earth will go into a time of intense labor. So painful things will happen on the earth. And as the labor pains intensify and increase in frequency, the signs leading, leading up to Jesus' uh, imminent return 
will also do the same. And uh, when those things begin to happen, Jesus said, uh, look up, lift up your heads uh, for your redemption draws near. So it is expected that there will be an increase of wars and commotions on the earth. Uh, but at the same time, I want you to notice what Jesus says. Uh, he says this, I do not want you to be terrified when all these things are taking place because these things are going to happen but I have got a plan he says I am coming back again and we've got to keep in mind also that although we see things unraveling in the world today our blessed hope is in the imminent return of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we ought not to be afraid of anything that is happening around us today. Certainly uh, we ought to be concerned about what is happening to others and uh, certainly uh, we should never be heartless and disengage from other, other people's woes and pains. So our hearts really go out to the Ukrainian people in this unprovoked war with Russia, uh, a sovereign nation invaded by an evil man. So our hearts do go out uh, to them as we see innocent civilians die, families being broken up, hospitals and schools being bombed. It is really very hard to watch, but at the same time, we have got to be mindful of the fact that although our heart gets heavy with the things that we see, Jesus did say that those things are indicative that the end is near and that he is coming back again. Now, this is not the first time that Russia has invaded Ukraine. Between the years 1932 and 1933, Soviet Russia, under the leadership of Joseph Stalin, invaded Ukraine in what Ukrainians still remember today as murder by starvation. Stalin, he ordered food seizures and he literally starved to death between four and six million Ukrainian people. He cut off their food supply, uh, and so it was pure, pure genocide. Now today, Vladimir Putin wants to revive that old Soviet Union, that old Soviet empire again, of which Ukraine was part of. Now, in 2008, remember, Putin, he invaded uh, Georgia, and as recent as 2014, he annexed Crimea, um, you know, that's southern Ukraine, and now it is Ukraine. So, the people in those bordering nations like Estonia and Latvia and Lit Lithuania and Armenia and Belarus ought to be afraid. In fact, uh, as I speak, uh, Belarus is already an ally of Russia. Russia is into Belarus already. So, um, so all those other nations, uh, they ought to be afraid uh, because they were all once part of the old Soviet Union. And uh, if Mr. Putin gets his way with what he is doing in Ukraine right now, he will be so emboldened that he will go after all those other countries as well, those countries that I listed a while ago. And uh, you know what? Uh, 
Uh, Poland is also vulnerable, although it was not part of the former Soviet Union. Uh, here was a present ambassador uh, in Russia today who is from another country. He made this statement um, recently concerning Putin. Quote, he does not care about his people or his economy. He does not even care about his soldiers. He just wants to bring Ukraine under his heel. And all this is happening while the rest of the world is just watching. So it's really sad and shocking to see how disengaged the rest of the world is. This, my friend, is a classic setup for what the Bible says uh, is going to be unfolding in, uh, at the end, uh, in the end times. Uh, now, there's also supposed to be heavy sanctions against Russia on right now. Yet, in a recent clip that I saw, you know, there was a number of Western businesses, including Nike, that was still operating in Russia. So I, uh, we have to ask the question, is it profits before people's lives? That's really, really sad. That is how disengaged the rest of the world has become. And uh, what this spells is, uh, uh, it gives an open license for uh, Putin's end time agenda as far as Bible prophecy is concerned. Now, another international diplomat, he put it like this, I know that we cannot send our own troops to fight in this war there with Ukraine, but I feel like a powerful man standing on a street watching a woman getting raped and I am not doing anything about it. Now, I believe that that is exactly how most of us feel ourselves, helpless. We wonder why more isn't being done. And we also wonder, well, what could be done? Who will stop this madman called Putin? Are the sanctions doing anything at all? Are they working? Are they really enough? You see, it is like the uh, US and uh, Europe with all this power, but they are looking on powerless. And uh, all of us, uh, the rest of the world, uh, are w looking on at something terrible, something horrible taking place. You know, President Zelensky of Ukraine, he's a Jew. And historically, he knows something about endurance and survival. Now, we are seeing also that the Ukrainian people, they are very courageous people. God bless them. And may Almighty God continue to be gracious to them, to help them in a, an attack that is nothing less than pure, pure evil from an evil, evil man. Now, did you know that in the Hebrew language, the word for an evil man is the word Russia? In the English, it is spelled uh, R-E-S-H-A, but phonetically it is Russia. Now, as I go along, you will begin to understand why I am going through all of this. Simply, it is because the Bible says that in the end times, Russia will be the major player leading up to the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Bible prophecy says that at some point in time, and that can also include right now, 
Russia will gather other nations with it and uh, and, and, and it will happen in one of two ways. It will happen either by alliance or through dominance. As I said a while ago, Belarus is uh, already an ally of Russia, see? But my personal belief is that, you know, this gathering of the nations is going to happen through dominance, like what is uh, happening in Ukraine right now. Dominance through military might, military force. But either way, the Bible says in Ezekiel 38 that Russia would be the leader, the initiator in bringing the nations together and they would converge, they would all converge against Israel in the end times. They will surround the walls of Jerusalem and come against Israel. Now, the prophet Ezekiel, he told us that it is really God in his prophecy who puts a hook in the jaw of Russia and the other nations. So it is God who really initiates this end time move against Israel so that Israel and the nations of the world would know that he is God. Now, some of the nations that Ezekiel says uh, will, that will come against Israel, uh, and I'll just give you a sample. You know, Magog, that's Russia. Persia, that's Iran. You know, Persia was changed into Iran, the name Iran, in the year 1935. Kush, that's Ethiopia. Put, that's Libya. Goma, that's Eastern Europe, like Estonia and Latvia, and Lithuania and Belarus and Ukraine, Armenia, Georgia, Asia Minor, like Turkey, Greece, and the Arab nations, and so on. Now, let me state at this point that we are not talking here about the Battle of Armageddon. This is not the Battle of Armageddon. This is a military campaign that starts before the tribulation period and it will continue, as the Bible prophecy states, throughout that seven year tribulation period and then it culminates in the Battle of Armageddon. So by the time you get to Armageddon, the Bible, the Bible says also that you're going to see nations coming from other parts of the world. See? They are coming from other parts of the world to join that Ezekiel 38 group that I made reference to a while ago. You know, that group from the North, North Russia, Iran, Turkey, Belarus and so on and so on. Now Revelation 12 says this, there will be kings coming from the east and they will all gather in the valley of Megiddo and they will be coming against Israel. They will be converging against the nation of Israel and some of those uh, nations are China and India and Korea and Japan, and so on, just to name some of them. Bible prophecy also states that the river Euphrates will dry up, and that event will allow all those nations from the east, I'm talking about the whole Pacific Rim, to join with the others, all the others from the north and the Middle East and so on, against the nation of Israel. So the formation of this military campaign that I am talking about uh, that is recorded in um, Ezekiel 38 is what Jesus calls uh, the beginning of birth pains leading up to his return. Now did you know that only two weeks ago China conducted uh, war exercises uh, 
which encircle the island of Taiwan. And that is a mirror image of what Russia is doing. With the, so there's a possibility that there will be an invasion of Taiwan by China in the near future. Now, as Christians, we ought not to be caught off guard by this. But when we see these things beginning to line up, we ought to take note because we ought to be the most informed people on the planet because we have the Bible, the Bible that gives us a glimpse of the things that will take place in the end. So we should not be uh, surprised nor caught off guard by all these things. Yes, we should be concerned about all those people who are caught in the crosshairs of wars and invasions and so on and natural disasters and also in the crosshairs of mad people like uh, Putin, uh, insane people with selfish ambitions. But in the midst of it all, we should be able to step back and uh, say, okay, all this is happening. Jesus himself said uh, that these things will be the signs of the times, which should mean to every one of us born again believers in Christ uh, that his return uh, is surely getting closer and closer and closer. So we need to take note, uh, lift up our heads uh, for our redemption uh, is drawing near my friend uh, and uh, we should know beyond a shadow of a doubt through all of these things uh, that surely certainly jesus is coming back again hallelujah now we should be able to process all of these things uh, through the grid of the bible to give ourselves comfort and hope and uh, to know that this current Russia-Ukraine war could likely be, and I'm stressing this again, could likely be part of the birth pains that Jesus spoke about in Matthew 24. Now, there are some things that, you know, we ought to, to also keep in mind that the church will not be here during the tribulation. We will be raptured before the actual seven-year tribulation begins. We are here right now only because the things that are happening now, these are the beginning of birth pains. But get this, we will not be here. Read my lips. We will not be here when the actual delivery happens. Yes, we are here while the birth pains are taking place, but when the delivery happens, we will not be here. We will be gone. And if you are one of those who think that you are still going to be here during the tribulation period, you know what? You can have my car and my house as well, because I will be out of here. So if you are one of those post-tribulation believers, fine, fine. You stay, that's all right. But I am gone. Farouk is gone. Because if the restrainer, the Bible says, who is Holy Spirit, if he is taken away, I am gone with him because I am sealed in Christ by the Holy Ghost, uh, in whom I have eternal life. Now remember also that it was Holy Spirit who started the church on the day of Pentecost. So if he is gone, the church is gone too. And I want you to check this out. God rescued, the Bible says, a righteous Noah and his household before he brought 
judgment upon the whole earth. Again, God rescued righteous Lot and his family before God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And I want to add this. The first five chapters of the book of Revelation talks about the seven churches. So those five chapters center around the church. But when you go from chapter 6 right through to chapter 18, see, that's when you read of the seals being broken and the seals of God's judgment being poured upon the earth during the tribulation period. There is absolutely no mention of the church on the planet earth chapter 6 through 18 the church is absent yes now when we pick it up from chapter 19 right down to the end of the book of revelation to chapter 22 that's after all of the judgments are poured out upon the earth and and so on the church is seen up in heaven with the Jesus, with her bridegroom. We are the bride. He is the bridegroom. See, and and we are there at the marriage supper of the Lamb. So, the only reason why we are here right now is because these are the birth pains. I I, I believe that are happening right now, but when Revelation 6 through 18 unfolds. I'm talking about uh, the time of the tribulation and, and the great tribulation. We, the church, we would have been caught up, raptured with our Lord in the clouds, and forever, the Bible says, we are going to be with him. Hallelujah. The next thing I want us to see is this, uh, that when Jesus comes again with his church to end the battle of Armageddon. He will defeat every foe and he will crush every enemy that sets itself up against God and against the nation of Israel. So that was a quick look at um, a Bible prophecy and Matthew and Luke and Ezekiel and Daniel but this is really my major focus today see so let's look at the the book of Revelation come to the book of Revelation now Christians throughout the centuries uh, they have seen the book of Revelation as uh, the book of end time prophecy only as the book of end time prophecy but you know the book of revelation itself tells us in chapter 19 that the testimony of jesus is the spirit of prophecy in other words jesus christ he is the centerpiece of prophecy you see, people, uh, a, a number of Christians, they see the book of Revelation as just a book of end time prophecy. But I'm trying to introduce a, a new understanding, a fresh understanding here that Jesus Christ is the centerpiece of all prophecy. And not only is he the master key of prophecy, he is also the cause of all Bible prophecy. He is the reason, my friend, that there is prophecy at all in the first place. So, although the major part of the book of Revelation is given to prophetic events of the end times, uh, that's 30 chapters, you know, out of 22. I mean, 16 through 18. Uh, no, not 16, 6. Chapter 6 through 18. Although those chapters deal with the seven-year tribulation period, 
I want to state categorically that end time prophecy is not the real focus of the book of Revelation. See, because the book of Revelation, it is the primary revelation of our risen Lord Jesus Christ and not necessarily a revelation of end time prophetic events. See, end time prophetic events, they are just secondary to the real purpose of John writing this book of Revelation. Now, in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1, that's at the beginning of the book of Revelation, these are the words. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto John, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. So it's a revelation of Jesus Christ, not a revelation of end time events. Those things are just secondary. See? Now the reason for John writing um, the book of Revelation is simply because the church had moved away from its spiritual base, which is a present day revelation of Jesus Christ. And the church had fallen into the same sins that the Apostle Paul had warned Timothy about in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Hear what it says. Uh, Paul said, in the last days, perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And the list goes on. So the Apostle John, he wrote, the Gospel of uh, John, the three epistles of John, and also the book of Revelation at the end of the first century to bring the church right back to its spiritual base, which was a revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we will note that after his resurrection, on the Emmaus Road, Jesus, he uh, explained to the disciples there that uh, he was there in all of the Old Testament scriptures, all the law and all the prophets and so on. So the central figure in the whole Bible, my friend, from Genesis to Revelation is the person of Jesus Christ. And you know something? Jesus will be the main focus, the central focus for all of eternity because God's eternal purpose for mankind was always, always in Christ Jesus. So having established that as a kind of preamble that I'm talking about that critical understanding of the revelation of Jesus Christ in this book of Revelation. And also, having established, as I did uh, earlier, uh, about those end times events uh, from Matthew 24 and Luke and Ezekiel and Daniel, I want us to just look a little closer at the book of Revelation, but we want to take it from another perspective, a fresh perspective on the book of Revelation. Now, the first thing I want us to note is that the book of Revelation, it is the last, it is the final book of the Bible. And uh, it has fascinated Christians uh, for 2000 years. Now, what is interesting is that when our Bible was compiled, 
when the 66 books were canonized and placed in a particular order, particular sequence. Although, you know, at the time there were many Hebrew texts and Greek texts fl uh, floating around, the church put the book of Revelation as the last canonized book. Now, anybody, just anybody with some kind of literary sensibility knows that what comes last, in a, whether it be a poem or a novel or a play, is of great, great importance. Now, very often, admittedly, the beginning, the opening line of a novel or of a play will tell you a lot about the story. But really, the way the story ends, the way the play ends, is of extraordinary significance, my friend. So if the church decided from very early that the entire biblical revelation would end with the book of revelation then we ought to look at this book with great great interest as starters the word revelation is an english translation of the greek word apocalypsis from which we get the word apocalypse meaning the final destruction of the world. If you check the dictionary, the English dictionary, that is the meaning you will find. So apocalypse means the final destruction of the world. And right away, because of that, the book of Revelation takes on the meaning of the book of the end of the world. But you see the Greek word apocalypsis, does not mean apocalypse. Apocalypsis means an unveiling, the taking away of the calypsis or the veil. So although, you know, we see earthquakes and disasters and stars falling from the sky and the world falling apart and so on, there's something, something more than just the end of the physical world that that uh, uh, contain that's contained there in the book of revelation because something is being revealed in that book something that was hidden is being unveiled to us now i know that some of this may you know be heavy weather for some of you but hang in there i'll kind of you know open it up for you as best as i can but i do uh in this teaching i do get an opportunity now to preach on end time bible prophecy take taking it from a fresh new perspective and uh, not follow that uh, you know old traditional path of preaching on the antichrist and 666 and the mark of the beast and so on so there is a record in the book of revelation of the great great tribulation events that will be taking place but i see yeah in all of that more than just the end of a physical world because remember the physical always pointed towards the spiritual the temporal always pointed towards the eternal so the book of revelation was meant to unveil something that every generation of christians needs to see
to see beyond the violence and the upheaval and the earthquakes and the floods and the disease and the famine and the stars falling from the sky and water rivers turning into blood and so on and all those terrible things that certainly sound like the end of the world but let me take a moment and suggest something to you right now that what is being described there in what I call very, very evocative language is what it's like when an old world is given way and a new world is being born. Now, by way of illustration, think of storms and when they take place. It is when like two opposite weather systems uh, when they meet, there are differences in weather conditions, differences in temperature, differences in pressure, and so on. They are two totally opposite systems which tend to produce storms when they clash. So, I want you to think of the book of Revelation as the meeting place of two opposite systems. The weather system of the old world, the old world order, predicated on uh, violence and death and evil and cruelty and so on and so on. And this is um, all that we are seeing there during the tri tribulation between chapter 6 and 18. So uh, the, that weather system of the old world meeting a new world system that is coming down from heaven above. Now, just like uh, how earthquakes happen um, when when the the the, um, the continental plates when they clash, see, when they meet, and uh, you see here the old order is clashing with the new order so what happens is that there are going to be storms and upheavals and earthquakes and catastrophes and disasters and so on uh, produce a meaning that the old world is given away and a new world is being born so you see i would really like us to look beyond just the sensation of you know the things that are happening on planet earth and uh, see the eternal see the eternal principles that are emerging those principles that are emerging from all of what is taking place in the natural because yes the temporal is going to pass away and the eternal is going to come and be there forever and forever. So, question is, what is this new world? Uh, in verse 4 of chapter 1, the book of Revelation says this, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is, which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth. Behold, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him. Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. This book is a book of the risen Christ. This is our introductory premise or introductory statement at the beginning of the book of Revelation. So, what then is this new world? It is the new world that is born out of the resurrection of 
Jesus Christ from the dead. Jesus raised him from the dead. That means that the whole order of the of the world is shaken and uh, that resurrection unveils something. It reveals something. It reveals that the world that God wants to be born is being born out of the ruins of the old. A brand new world founded on the risen Christ. I'm talking about the kingdom of God established on planet earth a new earth re recreated that will last forever and forever and forever so the opening of the seven seals and the pouring out of God's judgment upon planet earth as I said earlier from chapter 6 to chapter 18 in the book of Revelation is only the transition from the old to the new we are seeing physical events, yes, physical judgments that are really pointing to a new spiritual reality. A reality, my friend, that you and I will enjoy for all eternity. Hallelujah! So, the Apostle John continues in verse 9. I, John was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, Patmos is a little island off the coast of present-day Turkey. Now, at the time of John's writing, it was a penal colony, a place where Rome sent prisoners, a place where serious criminals were sent to because they were dangerous, high-risk escapees, and therefore they had to be isolated. Now, we remember some famous penal colonies like Australia. Yes, Australia was originally a penal colony where England sent all the most dangerous criminals. Next, near to us here uh, on the South American continent is French Guyana, which is next door to Dutch Guyana, which is uh, today called Suriname, and uh, French Guyana, where France sent their most notorious and dangerous cr cr criminals. Uh, we know of an infamous one called Papillon. There was even a movie on him. So here is John on the Isle of Patmos. Question, why does Rome put him in a penal colony. Why is Rome so afraid of him? Undoubtedly because he is declaring the Lordship of Jesus Christ who is now risen from the dead. And the Romans, they knew how revolutionary that message was. They knew that the Lordship of Jesus Christ meant that they all order was given way and a new order was being born. They knew the power of that message. So they tried to lock away the message by locking away the messenger. But penal colonies cannot lock out Holy Spirit, my friend. Because here was what John says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Hallelujah! It's Holy Spirit who makes the difference. Now, the Lord's day, that's very important here. Let's not run past its significance here. The Lord's day, Sunday, Resurrection Day. And uh, what then is the unveiling of this new world? It is the Lord's day, Resurrection Day, Sunday. It is the Lord's day because it comes from the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is what the new order, the new world is predicated on. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, the risen Christ. Without a risen Christ, there is no new order. So here, this is 
so significant. The third day, the Lord's Day, Sunday. See, and what was the Lord's Day? Well, then it was the day when Christians in the early church, when they gathered to pray and to worship God. Now, Jews, they would have gathered on the Sabbath day, that was Saturday, but the Christian said no. The next day, Sunday, the Lord's Day, the day of resurrection. Now, let me just offload quickly one of the many burdens that I carry. Because so many of us here at Faith Community Church want to live their Christian life, want to play by their own rules and not according to God's word. They want to serve God, but they want to serve God conveniently. What I'm saying is this, when I look at the attendance, sometimes a dwindling attendance on a Sunday, sanctifying the Lord's Day is not really a top priority for many of them. But <clears throat> sanctifying the Lord's Day in order to gather with the saints of God here at Faith Community Church for prayer and worship and ministry of the Word. It's not only a biblical call by God to not forsake the assembling together for ourselves, but really, my friend, it is a solid, solid New Testament principle that was so very, very dynamic in, uh, in, in the Christian's walk with God uh, way back then. And today, it becomes so much more critical. That's why our Sunday church meeting, I have called it or labeled it our Sunday sanctuary service uh, because I know what the Bible says. Uh, and uh, personally, I will not willfully <clears throat> dishonor and disobey God's word in my life. And uh, I want you to know more than that. I preach to myself because before I ever preach to you guys. You see, I first eat what I serve, what I serve to you. And because I carry the fear of God in me, and because I know that a rapture can happen at any moment, at any time, I do not want to be caught unprepared or caught with unfinished work in my hands and, uh, and be, you know, like, the, like how Paul put it, uh, having preached to you that I end up a castaway. So... Let's get back to John here. John says that something happened to him on Resurrection Day, the Lord's Day. Something happened to him when the, uh, on the day when Christians gather to pray and to worship God. He said this, I was caught up in the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. Well, just in case you miss it, that's what really ought to happen to us when we pray and when we worship and when we are in church, we are caught up in the spirit of Christ. And then he goes on to say, and I saw seven golden candlesticks and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the son of man. So the son of man was among the seven candlesticks and and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Now, we don't have time here, but uh, the um, Revelation goes on to explain that the seven candlesticks were the seven churches, and the seven stars in the right hand of the Son of Man, of Jesus, were the seven uh, angels or the seven senior or presiding ministers, the, the, the seven senior pastors of those churches. 
Now, uh, this is what he says, sees the Son of Man in the midst of these churches, seven churches, seven golden candlesticks. He sees the resurrected Christ. He sees the priest king and, it, and, and he is described uh, in those verses here, Jesus Christ, the priest king, in the midst of the seven churches, uh, giving God right praise on the Lord's day. Now, let me go back here. He was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and Jesus was there amongst the seven churches on the Lord's day, giving right praise to God. And that means the kind of praise that belongs only to Jehovah God. So there is something specific, there is something special about worship on the Lord's day, my friend. Hallelujah! Because that's exactly where Jesus is, and that's exactly what he is doing when we gather every Sunday on the Lord's Day to pray and to worship Almighty God, because that's the new order of the risen Savior, this King Priest called Jesus Christ, whom God, um, John sees uh, amongst the seven candlesticks. So it is my prayer that there is nobody listening to what I am teaching here who still thinks that coming to church on the Lord's Day is an option. No, it is not optional if you really, really get into you this revelation of the new order here in Revelation based on a risen Christ. Yes, a resurrected Christ. So God, through this new order, has called all of us born again saints whom he uh, uh, plant, whom God has planted together in the local assembly. He has called us to join with our priest king Jesus Christ in giving right praise. That is proper praise. That is the praise that is uh, uh, accepted by God. The praise that is expected of us. Not half-hearted praise. I'm talking about sincere, effectual, heartfelt praise and prayer that we bring unto the Lord on the Lord's day, which is the day of our risen Lord and Savior. Then, as we go on, Jesus says to John, John, do not be afraid. And those are the same words uh, that were used at the empty to uh, tomb, you remember, on resurrection morning. That was the, uh, the Lord's day again, the Sunday morning. And it was the same words uh, said by the resurrected Christ when the disciples saw him, you see, uh, do not be afraid. See, this is the resurrected Christ offering his peace to John. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid, he says. I am the first and the last, the one who lives once I was dead, but now I am alive forevermore. That's the resurrected Christ. That's the resurrected Lord. That's the priest king who we see exerting a new kind of authority and a new kind of power in the world. A resurrected Christ who has introduced his power of resurrection as the new authority of the new order in the new world that has come. Hallelujah. And don't miss this. The whole book of Revelation is now going to unfold as a meditation upon the power and the meaning of the resurrection. So this is why I said up front uh, that the book of Revelation is about the resurrected Lord. Uh, you see, and chapter 6 to chapter 18 where there are records of end time prophetic events and so on that's just an 
aberration. It's just a, um, a, a pause. You see, a hyphen between the first five chapters speaking about the churches and uh, picking up from chapter 19 to 22, which talks about what is taking place in heaven at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Hallelujah. So Jesus said, once I was dead, see, put to death by the power of Rome, put to death by a fallen world, but now I am alive forevermore. Through the power of God the Father, we see the Son having power over sin, death, hell, and the grave forevermore. Now a final question before I close. What does the world look like in the light of this resurrection? Well, as I said earlier, it's going to look like what we see recorded in Revelation chapter 6 through chapters 18, a time of great tribulation. It's going to look like the old falling apart. It's going to look like earthquakes and floods and fire and famine and disaster and blood and shock and death and stars falling from the sky. It is going to look like the destruction of all ways and all habits and the old order of living and the giving way to a new order being born in every one of us so there is nothing absolutely nothing to fear from what we see taking place around us today whether it be covid 19 the russia ukraine war or the wars that russia are going to be engaging in to come you there's nothing for you to be afraid of if you are part of the new order the new order based on a risen Christ, my friend. A new Christianity, a living Christianity of evidence, of power, of authority, the kind of church that Jesus says that the gates of hell shall not stand up against. The church militant, that's the kind of Christian, that's the kind of church that God is raising up these last days based on the power of a risen Christ. Hallelujah. Now, uh, I know that at times our enemies may seem powerful and may seem to overpower us. I know that at times life seems so hard and uh, impossible for many of us believers. But notice too, that that old world, their world, is going away and the new is coming to be. And this is how the scripture tells us to stay and to keep ourselves. This is what we do in the interim. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up, God tells us, and lift your heads for your redemption. Joy it nigh. Hallelujah. So this is the time, Faith Community Church, and every one of us here, this is the time to keep our focus on heaven and not on the cares of this world and the circumstances that so seem to overcome us. God overcome death, hell, and the grave, and there is a whole new world that is waiting for you and me. Come, Jesus. Come quickly, Jesus. Come, Lord. Let us take a moment and bow our hearts in prayer. Father God, we thank you for your word. And we thank you that you are on your throne. And although our hearts may be weary, 
with the challenges that we face every day as born again believers in Christ. Although we may carry concerns about what is going on in the world today, our hope is still in you, Lord Jesus. Our living hope is in your promised return. So, Lord, in the meantime, we will not be afraid. We stand on the promises of your word. So help us, Father God, <clears throat> to set our affections on things above. Help us to reset our priorities, to reset them away from the cares of the world and to enthrone you, Jesus, in our lives, you, the author and finisher of our faith. And Lord Jesus, as we see the birth pains increasing in intensity and in frequency, Help us, mighty God, to prepare ourselves to be ready. Help us, Holy Spirit, to be watching, to be a people looking and hoping for the time when you, Lord Jesus, will rapture your church. God, we take a moment to pray for the Ukrainian people, that you will help them Give them favor, God. We pray for all those grieving families who have lost loved ones. We pray that you would supernaturally push back the forces of evil in that unprovoked attack. Lord, it is really hard to know how to pray when you have told us that these things would come to pass. So all we can do is ask you to minister your grace and your salvation to all those who are caught in the crossfires of war and violence and for all of us here this morning gather this morning we ask god that you administer your grace and your power and your peace to all of us as we continue to do your will as we anticipate your coming, Lord Jesus. And now, if you would stand and receive the blessing, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace now and forevermore. Amen and amen. Amen and amen. Have a great week, everybody. See you next week.